Dr. Tom Fikes will introduce our speaker this morning. Thanks. Well, you know you're in a safe place when uh, they even keep the drummers in cages. I, I notice that that cage gets bigger and more substantial every year. I can only imagine that means that our drummers are getting more dangerous. It is a, uh, a real privilege for me to introduce our, our chapel speaker this morning. Uh, Calvin College philosopher Jamie Smith, in his book Desiring the Kingdom, reimagines the Christian liberal arts college as being more about formation than about information, more about shaping people than merely shoring up a belief system, as important as that might be. In his introduction, he says that every pedagogy implies a philosophical anthropology. That is, every approach to, to teaching, to learning, to what it means to be at a place like this, rests on an understanding of what it means to be a person. I think he's right, and that's why I'm so excited to hear from Dr. Thompson this morning. His, top, his topic has really wide-reaching implications. I've only just met uh, Dr. Thompson this morning, but I have enjoyed his book, Anatomy of the Soul, and I'm excited about the work that he's doing to connect neuroscience, or as, as he calls it, borrowing Siegel's phrase, interpersonal neurobiology, to connect that with the work of spiritual formation, the thing that uh, perhaps we're most uh, deeply concerned with as Christians. His emphasis on relationality and his use of the very existential phrase, being known, represent an important movement in the neurosciences right now. His grounding these ideas in Christian tradition and experience offer not only a direct and important means for us to live our Christian life well, but I think they also represent a means by which our Christianity can productively shape the development of neuroscience in the 21st century to help create a science of the person that takes loving your neighbor, community, and faith seriously. What does it mean to, uh, to get together a thousand of us and sing worship songs together? Uh, what's changing in our, in our brains as we do that? And uh, how can we leverage that to better be the people of, uh, of our Lord? I should say that Dr. Thompson is a real doctor, uh, board certified to practice medicine uh, as a psychiatrist and a neurologist. His private practice, he emphasizes the integration of the spiritual disciplines and the understanding of our embodiedness as a path to personal and interpersonal wholeness. In an age and a culture of disintegration, communal and personal fragmentation where anxiety and depression are pandemic, that is good news. I'm particularly excited about uh, the talk this morning where Dr. Thompson draws on another thread that's particularly interest, uh, interesting to me, and that is narrative. The, uh, the title of this morning's talk, In What Story Are You Living?, asks us to reconsider the role of story in shaping ourselves and the kingdom. I hope you will, uh, some of you will be able to join us this afternoon in Winter Hall 216, uh, 315 for uh, a bit uh, deeper dig into Dr. Thompson's work, but I hope that you'll uh, join me now in warmly welcoming him. Very generous. Very generous. Thank you. Wow, there's a lot of you out there. So um, perhaps a couple of introductory remarks. Um, most importantly, I'm uh, married almost 26 years. So, so automatically that, that means if you know me that my wife is a saint for having put up with me. I'm the father of a daughter who just graduated from college and a son who just graduated from high school. And so um, I know a little bit about what it means to be in the chairs that you sit, a little bit, in the chairs that you sit, in that for those of you who are here newly, you're just beginning this process of being in an educational environment. And for those of you who've been here for three or four or like seven years, um, 
you're in a place where you're having to figure out what you're going to do next and what this next several months are going to mean in helping shape who you're going to become. The other thing that is true is that I'm from Washington, D.C., and um, where everybody's anxious. Everybody. You may know there's an election, you know there's an election coming. It's some of you, many of you, perhaps hopefully all of you will vote if you're old enough to do that this year. But here's the thing. If you're in Washington and you're in office, you're anxious because you're afraid you're going to lose office. And if you're not in office, you're anxious because you're afraid you're not going to get into office. It just means that you're anxious, which means that if you're a psychiatrist, it's going to be a very good year. <laughs> it's really true. So those are some things about me, but I want to I come back to this idea that everybody here, and not just students, faculty, staff, everybody has converged into this space, not just this gymnasium, but into this literal space in the universe for a period of time in order for you to grow and be educated. You're going to get an education about lots of stuff in the next several years, and perhaps a lot of years if you're working here. You're going to get education certainly about academics. You're going to get an education about relationships. You're going to get an education about what it means to think vocationally. Hopefully you're going to get an education about what it means to be true physically in the world. You're going to get an education about lots and lots of stuff. And as part of that education, one of the things that we would assume that would be a good thing to do is to learn to love the Lord your God. And in the biblical narrative, one of the things that Jesus talks about is the importance of loving the Lord your God with all your mind. And so you go to college and you think that like, loving God with your mind is a pretty important thing. Now, maybe not for all of you, but you know, it's an important thing, at least for the teachers who are giving you grades. So this is a pretty important thing, to love the Lord with all your mind. Now, here's my question. If I'm supposed to do that, I'd like to know what my mind actually is if I'm supposed to love God with it. You, you think that'd be a nice thing to do? Like, I don't know if like, the first day you get here, when they say, love God with all your mind, and they say, and here's what your mind is. Do you have a class on that, where they tell you what your mind is? Maybe they, maybe they do. I didn't get one of those classes. So in my work, this field of interpersonal neurobiology, one of the things that we think is important to do is to actually help people figure out what the mind is. So that if we're going to love God with it, we'd actually have some sense of what that means. So. Here's a couple of ideas for you. Here's the first thing the mind is. The mind is embodied. First thing the mind is, is it's embodied. Notice I didn't say that it's just in your brain. I mean it's embodied, meaning that like it includes your brain, but it also includes your brain and your stomach and your hands and your legs. Anybody here ever get anxious? Yes. Okay. And if you get anxious, how do you know you're anxious? Where, how do, where, where do you feel it? You used to feel it in your stomach, right? And so you know, we already know that if I'm anxious, the way my mind registers that it is so is because the rest of my body gets involved. So we know that the mind is not just limited to the thing between my ears. My mind is fully embodied. St. Paul says, you know, if you, if you pay attention, you notice that the Holy Spirit is templed in your body. Do you not know, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? It doesn't say your brain is. It doesn't say your pinky is. It says, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. So the mind is embodied, but the mind is also a second thing. It's relational. It's relational. And that means this, that in order for the mind, meaning, meaning the brain that is in your head, along with the rest of it, in order for it to develop, it needs relationships. As we like to say, in nature, in nature, there's no such thing as an individual human brain. Now you might think, well, maybe I need to see a psychiatrist because you look around the room and there's about a thousand individual brains sitting in the room. But here's the news. The news is that nobody here in this room got to where you are all by yourself. 
everybody here has gotten here because of your interconnection with other people. And it's with that interconnection with other people that is constantly going on, whether you're paying attention to it or not, that is constantly driving who you are becoming, constantly shaping what your mind is. And so if I'm going to love God with all my mind, it's not just some abstract idea. It's not just about accumulating information. It's not just about doing the right thing. It's also about paying attention to a lot of things that the mind is about. Part of what it's about are its different functions, but part of what it's about has to do with the relationships in which we spend most of our time, effort, and energy. And we need to say that those relationships, those relationships most of the time, are taking place in your head whether anybody else is in the room or not. Does that make sense? Like, we think about people all the time. When we get nervous, when we're ashamed, when we're worried, like, it, it's because other people are influencing who we are in that moment. And so relationships are shaping my mind, and so loving God with all my mind means loving him with lots of stuff. The mind has certain functions. We're going to name a few. This is not going to be a crash course on neuroscience. We're just going to name a few. Here's one. We like to talk about the function of attention. Now, here's an important caveat. You can pay attention to this or not pay attention to this. And that is we like to talk about attention as being like the ignition key of the mind. There's nothing you do, nothing you do, that does not start with a shift in your attention. Everything that we do is being pulled by the engine of attention, what I'm paying attention to. And sometimes that attention shifts by intention, by my intent, and sometimes that attention is shifting all by itself. Like right now, perhaps half of you are just like working hard to pay attention, well, I mean, maybe to me, maybe to other things, right? But you know, your attention's everywhere. It could be like, gosh, you know, when can I get back to my room to go to sleep? Like, it could be that. But our attention is one of the things that drives our mind. Here's another thing. Memory. And by memory, we don't just mean, like, can I remember what those equations are in my chemistry exam? Those factoids I need to know for my history exam. It's not just about remembering that. Do you know that when you leave here today, you're going to have to remember how to walk? I'm, I'm guessing most of you won't forget. But you're going to have to remember how to walk. That's a kind of memory that most of us don't pay that much attention to, but it's a kind of memory that's influencing us non-consciously most of the time. And it's not just like what I do with my body. We have all kinds of memory that drive how I behave with other people. And most of that is something that I'm not often paying attention to. So we have attention, we have memory, we have emotion. We like to talk about emotion being the energy around which the brain organizes itself. You take, you take emotion out of the human equation, and human beings stop moving. You need emotion. You need gas in the tank in order for the car to run. So, so far, we're collecting lots of different functions. You've got attention, you've got memory, you've got emotion. We've got cognition, we've got logical linear thought processing, we've got those things as well. All these kinds of things that come together. There are a couple of other caveats about the mind that we'd like to keep front and center though. One of them is this, it's a thing I call the iceberg principle. That's this. On average, anywhere from about 70 to 85% of everything you do that requires the work of your mind is done non-consciously. Icebergs, about 80% of the iceberg is under the waterline. Most of what we do from the time we get up to the time we go to bed is done non-consciously, meaning it's something that I'm simply not paying attention to at any given point in time. It's automatic behavior. I'm not thinking about things, I just do it. I get in the car, I'm with my passenger, we're having a conversation, I drive five miles to the restaurant, we have dinner, and so much of that takes place, I'm not paying attention to it. But here's the news. It's not just driving a car. It's what you do in your conversations. It's what you do when you study. It's what you do when you do anything. So much of what you do is non-conscious. 
in its activity. That's one thing. Here's a second thing, and this is a really cool thing. There's a fancy schmancy term that's been tossed around in recent years, and it's called neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity, six syllables, it's, that's the most I can say. Se neuroplasticity, and it's this idea that the brain can change. This idea that my mind and the way it is wired can be different. It can be different. And it requires certain activities. It requires lots of aerobic exercise, for instance. It requires things like meditative prayer, spiritual disciplines. It requires things like being in a solid community that knows who I am and that I know who they are. There are lots of things that we can do to enhance neuroplasticity, but there's something that's really especially cool about this as it comes to what it means for us to follow Jesus, and that is this. St. Paul says in his letter to the Romans, therefore, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Renewing. Most of us, when we read that hear that, like that's a nice abstract idea, but here's the news. When, pa when St. Paul says this, it's not just about abstraction. It's about the real deal. It's about your brain being different. It's about Jesus coming, renewing the world in its entirety, in its physicality, and taking us along with it. And it begins here and now with renewing of our minds. This is really good news. So this stuff that we sing about today, very cool. But here's something to know. The way we sing, the way you, that, that you sing in a group this big, all of this has implications for actually changing the nature of what your neurons, all 100 billion of them, are doing in the brain. And so the more intentional we are about these kinds of things, the more we line ourselves up with changing through neuroplasticity that which God longs to change. And here's something else that's important to know. You all are here because you want to get an education, but you're not stopping here. You're here because you are going to be an extension of this place at some point in time. You're going to move into the world, and you are going to be a living, breathing, pulsating member of the kingdom of God. You're going to be a faithful transponder of what God wants to do in the universe. That's who you're going to become. And if that's who you're going to become, we need to know that these changes are not just about us. These changes are about changing our vocations. They're about changing who we're going to be as educators, who we're going to be as ministers, who we're going to be as chemistry people, who we're going to be as physicians, who we're going to be as whatever we're going to be, as artists, as musicians. It means the kingdom of God coming to fruition through the renewal of our mind. But it's back to that question of like, well, gosh, how do we do that? Like the mind is this kind of complex thing. And if we're going to love God with all of it, like we've just listed a bunch of things. And if you're going to like love God with all those things, like you're not going to have time to do homework, right? Because you're going to be too busy like me, swatting bugs. You think I'm seeing things up here. I'm not, I'm not really seeing things. I take care of people who see things, but I, I'm not seeing things. <laughs> so there's another piece of this story. And I use the word story intentionally. There's another piece of this story that is hugely important for what it means for us to love God. And that's this idea of what it means for us to tell stories. You see, because in neurologic development, there is one thing that it appears, I say appears for a reason, there's one thing that it appears that human beings do alone in our known universe, and that is we tell stories. As far as we know, as far as we know, dogs don't tell stories. We've tried to get them to tell us stories, they're not talking. But we, as far as we know, are the only biological entities that actually tell stories stories. There's some interesting things about the way we tell stories. We tell stories as a way to make sense of our lives. We tell stories because we're excited about things. 
But most importantly, we tell stories because we want someone else to hear them. We tell stories because we need and want, my mind, my brain needs and wants someone else to hear it. And so it's important to know that we tell stories out of this soup of attention and memory and emotion and cognition. I tell people, we tell three kinds of stories in general. The first story we tell are big stories. These are stories like, I believe in God, or I don't. I believe that human history is moving toward progress, or we're just a random set of events. I believe these big stories. But then we have what I call medium-sized stories. And these are more kind of like large but boots on the ground stories. And these would be things like this. I don't really believe that I'm good enough for my dad. I can't stop making myself throw up after every meal. I love being at this college. I'm so grateful for my friends. I could kill my sister. I see, you, you could, couldn't you? you? You could really kill your sister, right? I don't know what your name is, but I can see you later. It's, it's all right, it's fine. <laughs> but you see, these middle-sized stories are being shaped by the experiences that we have with other people. But they're not the only stories that we tell. We have big stories, we have middle-sized stories, and like, it doesn't take much, like I can say this, like you all know what I'm talking about. Like you've all got stories. You've all got those kind of middle stories. You've all got these big stories. But then we have what I call small stories, they're little ones. And little ones would be like, gosh, when is this guy gonna be done? Man, I really have to go to the bathroom. Boy, am I sleepy. Or we're not really even thinking that, I'm just sleeping, right? These here and now immediate things that are just going through our mind all the time. Storytelling. We're doing it all the time. Now, here's another thing that's important about storytelling that we do. A great deal of how we tell our story has got nothing to do with language. A great deal of how we tell our story has got nothing to do with language. It's got to do with things like emotion. It's got to do with sensation. It's got to do with perception, right? You walk in the door, you see her across the room, you don't know her name, but you know you want her name. <laughs> and you don't need to like write a paragraph out to know that you want her name. Amen? <laughs> but here's the other thing that happens. You see, if you're like some of the people that I see in my office, you could be somebody who grows up in a house where dad comes home angry most of the time and he's often angry at you and by the time you're 18 years of age, you've kind of figured out that dad's often angry in your presence and it seems like you feel really bad because you can't do what it takes to be what dad wants you to be and so the way you tell your story is to say, I'm just not good enough for my dad. When the truth is, is that you feel bad because your dad is really not good enough for you but I feel things long before those feelings become words. Does that make sense? And we're doing it all the time. So we tell stories. We tell stories largely without language. So imagine, given all the books that are out there about stories, imagine how much of those stories haven't yet been told because of the part of the story that is not about language. But here's something else that's really important. We never tell stories by ourselves. We never tell stories by ourselves. Yes, it is true that I may think things in my head, but the things that I think in my head, even in the privacy of my own dorm room, I'm thinking them as a result of experiences with relationships that I've had with other people. 
And we can tell one story to one person who listens to us with dismissal. And we can tell that same story to somebody else who listens to us with empathy. And we know the experience of telling two different stories. Does that make sense? And it's happening all the time. And so one of the things that we have to think about is this question of if I'm going to love God, with all my mind, my mind and what it is, all those things we listed, is being deeply shaped by the story that I'm telling. And much of the story that I'm telling, I'm not even aware that I'm telling it. And this is the story of the universe. It's a universe that's running headlong, trying to make sense of its life, telling its story in ways that don't necessarily help it that much. And you know, some of our storytelling might be okay, but then we have pockets. We have pockets of our story that we hide away. We have pockets of our story that aren't really part of the main theme. If we were to like go into that particular room of that particular book and read that part, I would make, man, that was really painful. I never see that in Julie. I don't see this in Roger. I don't see these parts of their story. That's because we're really busy making sure that nobody ever reads those chapters. It's important to know that storytelling did not begin with us. Storytelling began with God. The writer of the first few lines of Genesis tells us that God reflects. He said, let us make mankind. He tells a story. Let us make mankind. And then, when we're done making mankind to operate and be just like us, let's turn women and men loose to have dominion on the earth and to love it and to care for it and for each other and to be creative. That's the story. Now, we're going to tell this story. That's what God says, right? I mean, that's paraphrase. It's probably not in Genesis just like that, but you know what I mean. And so he does this, and then, you know, we screw things up. And then eventually there is this idea that God says, look, I'm sending the man. I'm sending Emmanuel. God's going to bring it. And in Jesus, God emphatically tells us a different story. He says to everyone, no matter what those parts of your story are that are hard to carry, no matter what parts of your story are lodged in emotion, and memory that we don't want to remember. He says, you are my daughter whom I love and in whom I'm well pleased. You are my son. You are my sons and daughters whom I love. This is the story that God is telling, that he has been telling from the beginning, but it's very difficult for us to pay attention to it because we're so distracted by all the stuff about our own story and other competing stories that won't let us pay attention to that story. This is the story that God is longing for us to take in. Now, God does an interesting thing. Jesus comes, Jesus lives, he dies, and we who follow him believe that God raised him from the dead. And he left the responsibility of the story with people just like us. What was he thinking? Perhaps he was thinking this. That in order for my story to become relevant, in order for my story to be changed, I'm going to have to have an embodied encounter with someone who is going to be Jesus for me. I'm going to have to have an embodied encounter with someone with whom I can tell my story in order that it can be heard, 
in order that I can be known. You know, St. Paul says this really interesting thing in 1 Corinthians. He says, the person who loves God is known by God. He doesn't say the person who loves God knows God. He says the person who loves God is known by God. Who knows you? By whom are you known? Because it is in this process of us being known who is the embodied representative of Emmanuel that creates space for all those parts of our attention and memory, emotion, and cognition that are broken and need healing to come to a place of being told, just like you sang about it, come to a place of being told, like, you're forgiven. Like, you don't have to ask for this. One John doesn't say, if you confess your sins and then ask him to, he's faithful and just to forgive you. No, he just says, if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you. Like, forgiveness is waiting for you. You don't have to go find it. And in that process of being known, your story and your brain changes. And so it's going to require active engagement with a community. Active engagement with two or three or eight or ten others. And this is a great crucible whereby which you can begin to practice that which you will take with you after I fix this into the next season of your life. It's going to require the presence of other people with whom you can be known. This is really hard work, but it is liberating work. And I got news for you. It's hard work, but you're going to work hard no matter what. As we say to patients, you can work hard and be in prison, or you can work hard and be free. But working hard is not an option. And so this morning, I want to invite you to consider these last couple things as we wrap up. In what story do you believe you're living? We pay all kinds of lip service to what we believe we're living in. But when we start to examine all these other parts of our mind with which we want to love God and be loved by God and be loved by others, then what does that tell us about the real story that we believe that we're living in? That's a question that's important for everybody to ask. I want to assure you that the story of the gospel tells you that you're living in a story of great grandeur, of great adventure, of sure suffering, and of endless joy. The question is, 